Awesome. So, hey, everybody. Um, welcome to Circus and Changing Realities 2020, a series of virtual dialogues about the future of circus. Um, I'm one of your moderators, Eliana, and Sonia will be co-moderating with me. Um, I founded the Circus Action Network a couple years ago to explore circus and its relation to social and environmental issues, and Sonia quickly became uh, came on board as one of our core collaborators. And um, we're really excited to be hosting this panel today with all of you uh, to discuss how we can rebuild post-pandemic in a way that is healthy and sustainable for both people and for the planet. Um, and so before getting uh, into our discussion, I just want to go around and have everyone introduce themselves. Um, so if everyone could say their name, where you're calling in from, and a little about yourself. And I'm going to go ahead and go first. So as I said, my name is Eliana. I'm currently located in Boston. Um, I've been doing circus since I was 10 years old. I studied at the New England Center for Circus Arts and the École de Cirque de Québec. And I'm currently studying anthropology and environmental sustainability through Southern New Hampshire University. And I'll let Sonia go next. Okay. Hi, I'm Sonia. Um, I am currently in Vermont. And uh, similarly to Eliana, I started circus when I was around 10 and also have studied at New England Center for Circus Arts and École de Cirque de Québec. Um, and I also recently graduated from Brown University where I studied environmental studies and creative writing. And Matt, do you wanna go next? Yeah, sure. Uh, my name is Matt Horton. Uh, I'm based in Sweden from the UK uh, and I uh, attended Circa Media and then uh, Dance of Circus Erg School L, uh, DOC uh, here in Sweden. Um, yeah, my practice is mainly working on sustainability within the equipment that we use in circus um, and uh, finding like closed um, closed system recycling for making equipment for use in aerial on stage. And Alison, do you want to go next? Hi, I'm Alison Funk. I am in Sweden. I am the head of the program that Matt just mentioned. So I am currently the head of the bachelor degree in circus at the school that was formerly known as DOC and is still known as DOC in the circus world, but we've had an institutional name change. So you will see us using the acronym SKH, which stands for the Stockholm University of the Arts. And I am formerly from Montreal and before that from the United States. And I have been a circus performer and educator and instructor and teacher educator and circus researcher and I specifically research circus education in higher education contexts. Awesome, thank you. And Will, do you wanna go next? Are you there, Will? I think we might've lost him. All right, Valentina, do you want to go next? Yeah, sure. Hey, I am Valentina. I am originally from Chile, and I came to study at Circomedia five years ago. I finished my degree, and I am co-founder of the, the Bull in a China Shop project, which is a circus research project that focuses on making work with an audience for an audience about compassion and collaboration. Awesome. And Will, do you want to try again? <laughs> Sure, second try. Can you guys see me now? Yeah, sweet. So uh, I'm still William, uh, living in Quebec, Canada. I'm doing uh, circus uh, professionally for over 10 years now. And for the last five, six years, I'm running also a company with my brother, Vincent, here in the, in the panel. Uh, so we have a nonprofit organization. And uh, in that, I have my own group called Quetzalcoatl, which we created that in 2008 in Quebec City, uh, and uh, we're specialized mostly in festival and uh, street shows. Awesome. And Vincent, do you want to go next? Hi, I'm Vincent. I'm currently based in Utawe in Canada. And uh, yeah, like William said, we have a nonprofit organization together. We, um, my side, well, no, we, we share all the sides together, but I specialize in vertical dance. So I'm trained as a dancer and then a circus artist. And uh, I specialize in vertical dance and in situ. So um, using, um, 
the place, like investment, like just setting in a place and using it as it is and trying to make it shine to the audience so people see the place differently after. Excellent. Um, and I think Crystal will be joining us shortly, but we'll go ahead and introduce her when she uh, comes online. Oh, there she is. <laughs> Speaking of Krista. Hi, Krista. Hi there. Perfect I'm sorry. I'm late to the party. <laughs> <laughs> no worries. We, we're just finishing up introductions, and I was just saying that we would introduce you as soon as you showed up. So if you want to go ahead. And, <laughs> we're beginning. <laughs> um, yeah, tell us your name, um, where you're located, and uh, just a little bit about you. Sure. Um, hi, everybody. Um, I'm Krista Bradley. I am uh, at APAP, the Association of Performing Arts Professionals. Um, I'm the Director of Programs and Resources there. We are based in Washington, D.C., a crazy place right now. Um, and um, let's see, what can I tell you? So APAP is best known for um, its big convening in January in New York City, which is, um, you know, uh, the 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 convening for the um, international presenting and touring and booking um, conference. So people that are our members are uh, touring uh, international artists, also the agents and managers and producers that support them and the presenters that actually book those artists. Um, I, um, we also actually are the service organization for this this particular industry. So we do a lot of professional development for artists and presenters and, and talk about issues that around touring in general. Um, a little bit of background in terms of my circus work. Um, I was a presenter and was part of um, an international collaboration whose name is like completely escaping me right now. Um, shoot. Well, it was a collaboration with among um, Sweden and Barcelona and uh, Tohu and the US to try to increase the number of presenters that were familiar with circus and to increase touring in North America. Um, and so I was one of the, the presenters in that two year project. And so became completely in love with circus and became, you know, we did a lot of programming. So um, circus is near and dear to my heart anyway. So I'm super excited to be with you all as a result of, of that background. Does that help? Is that, Eliana, was that enough? Okay. Yes, that was perfect. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, all right. So to get a little bit back into what uh, today's discussion is going to be about. Um, so I recently read a paper called Deep Adaptation by Jem Bendel, who's a professor of sustainability and leadership. Um, and his paper discusses deep adaptation. He poses a series of questions that I thought would be an interesting framework for discussing these issues within the context of circus. And so he puts forward what he calls the four R's of deep adaptation. Three are from the original paper and one is from a subsequent blog post. Um, and each of the four R's begs a different question. So resilience asks, how do we keep what we really want to keep? Relinquishment asks, what do we need to let go of in order to not make matters worse? Restoration asks, what can we bring back to help us with the coming difficulties and tragedies? And reconciliation asks, what can we make peace with to lessen suffering? And so we wanted to think a little bit about how these um, how these four R's can apply to circus and what kinds of questions we ask we can ask um, to use this kind of framework to apply to circus. And we came up with some other questions, um, which are, what about circus do we really want to keep and how do we keep it? what can we let go of and what, what might we have to let go of and how can we make peace with that? Are there things that circus about circus that we can say good riddance to? What might we want to add or change? What are some aspects of circus that we don't see much of that could be beneficial if implemented widely? Um, are there things from circus past that would be beneficial to revive? And finally, how might we prepare circus artists differently for the future? Um, so we thought we'd just sort of start and dive in, um, and we were wondering if anybody has any initial thoughts or responses to these questions and ideas. All right, so we can focus this a little more. We realize it's a very big topic. Um, so maybe we can start with um, looking at things that seem sort of directly Jeopard like things about circus that are directly jeopardized by 
the pandemic uh, and by climate change. Um, so like, in other words, what are, what are we gonna have to change as a result of both of these crises? Um, and if anyone wants to jump in, they can, or I'll, I'll start calling on people. <laughs> Matt, go ahead. Yeah, yeah I think um, the big thing that I have here is travel. Like it's one of the biggest problems uh, with the climate crisis. It's also one of the biggest things that has been disturbed by the pandemic now is travel, cross-country travel, like uh, between countries and in and out of Europe, it's impossible at the moment. Um, and I think it's uh, like a really good, um, like it's a really good example right now of uh, what, <laughs> what the things that we actually need to do um, like how that is going to impact circus like we have to stop traveling so how is that going to impact circus in the long run and at the moment it's completely shutting down it's uh, like most of the work that i had was traveling between countries and um to other places and because of the pandemic that shut down um yeah and it's something that i've been mindful of anyway um but it's just a really good uh, wake-up call as well and it's uh, something that it's, it's being shown that it's possible to cut down on travel now, which is really good. Um, but yeah, I think that's it's one of the biggest uh, questions for me is how, how can circus exist without the travel? Because as well, it's something that people seem to aspire to. Like a lot of people come into circus with the mindset that they want to travel. And it's something that's quite inherent in circus and it has been for years and years and years. It's like part of the history of circus. and. It's always been like a transient community that, move, that um, um, moves around, but how can we uh, limit that or how can we keep it local, I guess, is my question. Alison, if you wanna go ahead. I think, uh, Matt, you bring up an important idea that travel has become the way we do circus. If you look into circus history, there have always been traveling the performers. So that's a deep part of circus history. But it used to be also a deep part of dance and of singing and theater. And those different art forms have been codified, have been systematized in different ways. And perhaps because travel was such an important part of the way circus developed in the United States, it was so widespread, that model has been exported from the United States around the world quite a bit. But before that, the first, first circuses, the, the thing that what we know became circus, right? The 1700s Astley circus, the round horses running, doing tricks interspersed with other performers, that developed into a lot of fixed circus buildings in most countries. And that was the form of circus before the major traveling began. The major traveling was a response to how spread out the population in the United States was. So one show would travel around and get different audiences rather than having a theater or a circus building with a house troupe that kept changing their work that people would come and visit. So when you talk about restoration, maybe one of the things we think about restoring is how arts interact with communities. Maybe arts are not transient, but more part of the community itself and interacting with that community. Krista, go ahead. Yeah, Allison and Matt, I really appreciate both of your thoughts about that. I mean, in terms of the touring, you know, I work in a field right now that is like, we're supporting the whole touring industry. So the whole idea of climate change um, means that we have to reimagine what we do. And part of that is maybe um, working regionally, maybe to your, your point, Allison, that, you know, my, my history that, that I know about his uh, circus and any sort of theater troupe is that they were in like a, you know, a truck, like riding on the, on the road. So is there a way to, uh, for us to maybe chunk out the ways that we work regionally so that if you are traveling you and you're based in a local community that you are just traveling within that region not, not getting on a on a flight so that's one thing but also you know 
does circus have to be experienced um, in a theater? Just a question. I mean, there are a lot of people right now and a lot of artists are developing work to be seen in a different kind and experience in a different kind of way um, through the screen, um, you know, and, and not saying it replaces in-person work, but there's a new platform that people are finding really interesting. And so I wonder, are there ways that you can increase access to the art form by using this platform and reach people that you would never reach otherwise, or that would never be able to get to the theater? Um, or just would open up a whole different kind of world. Will, do you want to go next? Yeah, sure. Um, so yeah, basically I, sh I share the, the, the same thoughts than uh, Matthew, Allison, and Krista uh, about uh, for sure the traveling, which is why a lot of circus artists start doing circus, right? Is to travel and connect with different culture and community all over the world. Um, the thing is, uh, yeah, I think it's to ask ourselves how can we, how can we tr tour more local and on a national level. Um, I think that would be super helpful. But the thing is also, it's not necessarily possible uh, right now uh, in terms of uh, financial activities. I think we need the help of uh, government or some organization to for that. Because, like, for, for us, as an example, I don't know what it is uh, all over the world, right? But for us in, in Quebec, we do have help from the government, which is super helpful. But we're almost losing money working here in Quebec and in Canada, which is super sad because it would be great to just show what we do here. Like, in, 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 in the province of Quebec and Canada, we create amazing circus artists. And at the end, we can't really even work here or just seasonally, right? So I think it would be great to yeah to find a way of of getting the help from the government to be able to be to to stay here and uh, and and have a better structure to to our tours. Um, yeah, I think that would be it. Yeah, I think something I'm kind of interested in um, to think about in addition while we're we're thinking about all these questions is what are some of the things. Uh, like the roadblocks that we feel like we're facing with sustainability and with um, kind of implementing some of these ideas and yeah what are some of these roadblocks and, and things we might need to do in order to try and get around them if anybody has thoughts on that or I'll ask another question well well you know, I had a question is are you saying that you can't um, that that uh, Quebecois artists can't make a living yeah, just staying in Quebec because there's not enough work and you need the touring money to be able to to sustain. I just wanted to clarify, is that right? Well, Will, I could answer because, yeah, we shared a company. Basically, it's that uh, Quebec is in, the, the province of Quebec uh, specifically is in a strange situation where there's a lot of circus artists. A lot of circus artists are coming out every year and not a lot of them are moving outside of these main area. So let's say just Montreal itself, like there's so many circus, circus performers that just want to work and they have great talent, but they're all within Montreal. So uh, for sure, like, there's a lot of circus shows in Montreal, but there, there's not a lot of audience. Also, the reality, and I don't know about other countries, but in Canada, we don't have a lot of history of going to the theater, going to the dance. People are still mainly um, staying home and, and getting involved into arts as um, going to see a show uh, is, yeah, I would say there, there's less audience there. Um, I'm trying to, like, let's say with in-situ work, like on-site work, it's it's a big challenge to get people to come out, but it's also a good way for us to get them to come out because, like, they know they have, like, let's say that beautiful pier uh, near their houses. Then we try to invest it so so they are attracted to see what we do with that. But it's still quite a big challenge of getting people outside of their routine. Will, did you raise your hand? Uh, yeah, I just, uh, while Vincent was talking, and you remember me also, Krista, you, you, you spoke about the, the digital art, right? And this, I think, is, I mean, we, we see it right now with the pandemic going on. 
and it creates beautiful things, but also uh, it's going to be hard. Let, let's say for me as an example, I don't, I don't feel I'm a really a digital artist. I do, I'm doing circus to connect with the people one on one, and this is why I believe in in my art. The street is what I love the most. Is to really have this magical uh, moment with with the audience, even if it's few hundred people. I really feel in the street. Maybe because of the, all the liberty that I have, I can have this one on one with everyone there. And I think this is the tricky part of of trying to move. Uh, some people are just suggesting that we could move everything to the to the digital, which I I don't I don't think it's it's doable uh, for for long term. I think it there are ways, and we can start thinking and creating projects that are made for digital. That is 100%. But how how can we also keep this this theater thing, this this street thing, this very special connection that that we can have uh, into circus? Uh, I don't have the answer, but <laughs> those are my thoughts. Matt, go ahead. Yeah, um, just talking about like bringing circus like back out of the theater, kind of. Um, I mean, there's a lot of institutions and a lot of theater um, uh, spaces that are under threat right now. I know uh, I work in Ireland quite a lot. I work in the UK quite a lot. Um, and there's a lot of theatres that, because of the pandemic, they're questioning whether they can reopen in the near future, in the in the year, in a year and a half, because the funding is simply falling through. They're not going to be able to reopen anytime soon. So I think it's also a good way to to invest and think about how can we make site-specific work, how can we make work that's um, accessible to more people. Then again, it's um, we can do this, and a lot of the a lot of the digital content now that's being produced is being produced uh, for free. And it's how can we manage to produce this kind of work and still be able to be paid to do this? Because uh, at the end of the at the end of the day, we work uh, in a capitalist society where we we need the money um, to be able to survive. And this is what's under threat at the moment because of the pandemic and arts are one of the first things to go. So how can we preserve that? And how can we reimagine the work that we're doing for spaces that are not traditional? Krista, do you want to go next? Yeah, I, I really love that, uh, Matt, because I think that the untraditional spaces will be key. Um, and, and to your point, William, the outdoor space, the outdoor venue, the street corners will be critical and are the first to reopen. For for those of us working in the field, I have a webinar tomorrow about reopening theaters and you know how can we reopen without a um, vaccine? And the you know are there ways that people are are planning for that? And many theaters are thinking, how can I take things outside, right? So how can I actually program outside? How can I actually create social distancing outside? And kind of with street with street work, you've got that built in, which is fantastic. So there may be ways to really think about um, the location and access to artists uh, to audiences and connection with audiences um, using you know the outdoor um, venue as 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 a as a really good um, way to do that. Um, in terms of monetizing it, it's interesting. Um, I just want to share a a story about a place here in Baltimore, Maryland. Um, it's it's a performing arts organization that is really supportive of individual artists. And they were trying to figure out how to raise the visibility of local artists and get the money. And so they created a system where the people that wanted to see them would buy a ticket and then um, Creative Alliance, which is this organization, would then book the artist for like an outdoor space, like maybe like the corner of, of a corner, you know? And then basically they would text all the people that, that bought a ticket to say, this artist is gonna be here at this time on this date. And they would all go and it was great. Like the artist got the money, people were socially distant, they got paid and it's turned into a really interesting model. So um, I share that because I think that there's something we can learn from that as, as individual artists and those of us that are supporting artists and trying to connect artists and communities together. 
Valentina, you can go ahead. Hey, um, so I think it's a really critical question about how work is going to tour and how that a circus as well is really like part of what circus is. Um, especially in the future where economically it's looking very tricky for us. And I think like we do have to imagine new ways of doing so, but also sustainable, sustainability wise. And in Chile, there's this company called Familia Carromato, which they made their own little traveling theater, basically, with no help from the government, just completely self-sufficient. And they tour in a self-sufficient way as well. They go places, they ask somebody, can I just park here and do a show? They charge tickets, they do their show. Um, which I think it's a lot of legwork, but it works in a minimal scale and they can live off that. Uh, so maybe there is a thing there about reducing the scale that we imagine circus being as well. Maybe it doesn't have to be a big spectacle, maybe it can be smaller, but it would be such a shame to lose that in the same way. It's like, what do we let go of to be more self-sustainable and more uh, what's the word? Well, just like be able to keep making our work through the next very tricky time that we're going to face. Yeah. Vincent, if you may. Yeah, um, bring it back to simplicity is something that's really nice. Uh, also, because um, right now what i feel sometimes with performers is circus bloom within the last few years like it really really like exploded and i feel sometimes like um we we made a lot of uh stars <laughs> like performers that that walk in and i expect to only perform and do nothing else and i feel like the the whole circus world needs a little bit more of um jack of all trades you know like yes you are specialized in in your trapeze or in your juggling it's really nice but be part of the family like there, there's that whole family sense that i felt within the last few years that kind of went a little bit away and i think it would uh bring back more to family involving people more all together within the same project i believe would help on all those levels like it would be on the touring having let's say let's just say we need to travel to another destination instead of traveling a team of 25 can we have more people doing a little bit of each other's work and then sharing the work and then bring it a little bit back to yet yeah, to the um, yes yeah, smaller teams more efficient team uh, i think right there we we could save at least one or two flight tickets <laughs> environmentally would, will help a little bit, but also uh, generally uh, it would help also like bringing back some of those roots of circus, which is together building something instead of like one person that says, you do this, you do this, you do this, and then this is the show and we're selling it out. Krista, do you want to just say, um, say something real quick? <laughs> before you have to leave. <laughs> Trying to type it in fast. <laughs> I'm so sorry, I have to leave. We, uh, you know, um, in the States here, we are like every organization as a service organization, we're trying to come up with different scenarios to survive, you know? Um, and we have an emergency board meeting on Thursday and we've been asked to come up with different scenarios like today um to to edit so i have to hop off and get ready for that but um it was lovely meeting you and i'm so glad to be in the company of circus folks and i'd love to um continue talking i think it's really really interesting conversation and um you know as we talk about how does the touring industry just in general rethink what we're doing i think that the circus um artists and circus companies and the way that they make work and they deliver work can offer some really interesting um guidance and inspiration so i hope that we can continue talking so good to see you all take care thanks so much krista thanks so much eliana for inviting me bye bye <laughs> um all right allison i think you you had said you wanted to um say something I have a thought about change, which is inevitable, right? 
always in life, but the human mind is very good at being afraid of change and also remembering the past as if it was safe. Because if we're around to remember the past, we usually made it through. Like, let's be honest. So the people that aren't still around might, not, might remember it differently. Uh, but we tend to say, oh, if only things were like they were in the past when they were good. But actually, there's always change happening that's always challenging what we're doing. And I wonder if we can think about this moment already in the past when it was fine. So remember that time when everything we knew was upended and then we made some interesting decisions and we had a huge creative fusion uh, and influx, infusion, I think is the word I meant. Change is usually not chosen. It's usually forced on us. Most of us don't choose change when we have the chance. Right. Um, when we're quite young, we tend to choose change more often, and those changes are built in. So you graduate from a school, you find a job, you're moving jobs more frequently. But the longer we go on in life, the less we choose to destabilize the things we're familiar with. Because it's terrifying, and we don't know what's on the other side. Just putting that out first, right? So we are all living through a change we didn't choose. However, when you destabilize something, you open up new pathways and new ideas. You open up new opportunities and you get to respond a little bit more to the present. And as you're saying in this meeting, try to assess what we still want. What's, what are the real values and experiences we have and what do we need to make that happen? And so I want to challenge a, a couple ideas, maybe. Maybe challenge isn't the right word. But it's come up, uh, the Polycan Sims brothers brought up this conflict between, this tension between artistic activity and monetizing that activity. And those are two different things, actually. One is a drive to create, to share, to re-envision, to re-envision the spaces, to re-envision the relationships with strangers. And the other is the fact that it takes a lot of your time and expertise, and therefore it should also earn you money. So you don't have to spend your time earning money with something else. Okay. Right now, our, as Matt brought up, our economic system is one that requires us, if we are going to be a specialist, to usually earn money from that. But perhaps as we're shaking things, we might, we might find other ways of reimagining or reconnecting with the way we think of money and of being a specialist. Right? I can be a professional, I can be an artist, I can be a specialist, and maybe all my income doesn't come from that one thing. Maybe I'm earning income in order to create the art, or maybe the art is part of a cycle of different income. That's one idea. And then I have one other idea, which is completely the opposite of what Valentina and Vincent said, <laughs> which is to not go at all back to our roots, even though it feels great and it's amazing, and many people will do it, but instead to adopt a television model, which is there's a small live studio audience that pay for tickets to be the live studio audience, and then there's also some kind of digital broadcast. Or uh, there's a drive-in movie theater kind of situation where there's both a privilege of being live, but that privilege is or, you know, engaging with the action, but then there's also a digital relationship because the kinds of models that seem to be working in our era of free digital content, as Matt brought up, are streaming services where someone subscribes to a digital platform where they know they will receive certain content and they don't have to keep paying for each thing. Right? So perhaps there's a way of creating digital platforms that enable us to fund live events 
and that we are we privilege the live event, but we also share it on a different platform. Some ideas. Does anybody want to respond directly to those thoughts? All right. Um, Oh yeah, well. Well, I mean, uh, great ideas. Uh, the, the, that's for sure. It's super interesting. <laughs> I mean, this whole thing is super interesting because those are so big question. Uh, but yeah, I think I like I like this 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 last idea you had, uh, Allison, because uh, I think one of the problem these days is we are getting so advanced in technology that from again myself as an example, when I see a quick video made and, and put on the social media if it if it was like not a good quality i'm i'm not able to watch it entirely compared to tv tv is so big for 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 years and years now and it's also uh one of the first thing that really gonna start start again uh, we, we're booking some artists for some tv shows and it's easier for them to adjust it's like it, it can either be live audience or not, uh, and uh, and with with what is happening right now in the world with the pandemic, it's a little bit easier to control and uh, and regulate the, the, the either the crowd or just the technician that are there. But I think it's super interesting, yeah. To I think I think it would be for me uh, an option because I'm not ready to only do a show facing a camera and only a screen. And streaming it, I'm, I'm personally, I'm not ready for that, and I don't wish that we end up there. So I guess, yeah, at some point, it's like finding the right balance to it. So basically, it's super interesting what you said. Nice. Yeah, I think that's a really, a really interesting thought um, as well, and it hadn't occurred to me. So <laughs> really, kind of excited that you brought that up. Uh, yes, Valentine. I think it's really interesting and really exciting to think about the uh, many ways that we can like make circus in different platforms and in different ways to adapt to this very changing situation and the many ways that it's going to keep changing probably as well in the future. But I guess it's also, I don't know, for me, it's like, do we want to just change the form in which we do circus now to fit than future or do we change the way that we create and construct circus as well for the changing future like what how will the circus content and creation process going to change to maybe reflect what's going to come in the next i don't know the unknown Sorry, my thing froze for a little bit. Um, yeah, I think that's really interesting. Do you have any thoughts about how the creation process can change um, in the context of looking at sustainability or, or the pandemic? Valentina, if you want to go first, you can, because that was directed a little bit at you, and we can have Matt follow up. Uh, no, I think it may be, again, for me, it's always going back to like community and maybe it's about creating, as I like not using circus as perhaps the spectacle of it or like the finished process, but use it as a form of maybe creating more in the very local community so that you can, I don't know, interact with your neighbors in a way that you feel safe, fair and create a little kind of ecosystem of your own, if that makes sense. I don't know. But just like about making small communities feel tighter and helping each other out, kind of, maybe. I don't know. Thoughts are welcome. <laughs> really thought, didn't think this through much. Just ask the question. Matt, do you want to jump in? Yeah, I think it's really interesting what you say about um, like involving community a lot. and. Uh, being able to build spaces to create and use um, the techniques that we use to create within circus and like disseminating them out uh, to other art forms to other communities because I think that there's uh, 
high degree of adaptability, which is inherent in the way that we practice circus. Like we take uh, skills that are very specific um, and we take um, like a very demanding art form at, uh, at higher levels and we're putting it into spaces that it doesn't, mm, doesn't particularly lend themselves to those activities. Like we're really good at adapting uh, objects. We're really good at adapting to the spaces around us. And I think that's something that circus can um, help um, when we're talking about uh, entering other communities and uh, yeah, working with community work. Then um, something about uh, sustainable practice within circus, like the the things that I work on with um, aerial circus, it's like one thing that I see that because my work um, working with uh, aerial apparatus, I've gone into rigging a lot more and seeing the practices that we have in theatres and the practices that we have putting on circus shows and uh, the resources that we use to do that, it's not sustainable at all. And it's um, something that I think that we really need to be aware of um, as artists as well, because it's something that I wasn't particularly aware of before. Um, but the amount of waste that goes from one circus show is just absolutely ridiculous. Yeah, I think it's something that we need to be thinking about when we think about going forward sustainably, yeah. I think this idea that's um, come up a couple times about sort of diversifying what circus artists are doing is really interesting. And so um, I have a question that I'm gonna direct at Allison, but anyone can also, <laughs> Alice can also respond to it, but just in terms of in thinking about how we're preparing circus artists for the future and circus education, how might that change to encompass uh, like a broader skill set? Sorry, I'll just repeat that real quick. Um, so the question was, um, in thinking about um, how things might change and thinking about maybe diversifying what circus artists are doing, how might we, how might circus education change to prepare circus artists differently for the future? <laughs> well, that is a great question. I think, I have so many answers to that question that I don't know which one to use. I think university structures tend to be very difficult to change. So well-established programs might be very difficult to change quickly. But it depends on the values of different programs, what their fundamental intent is for the outcome of their students. So, <laughs> there's, there's so many answers. Uh, I was recently reading an article about curriculum in dance, as you do, that used the questions uh, from a, a man who wrote about curriculum in the 1970s named McDonald. And some of his questions about how to construct a curriculum are what does it mean to be human and what values are part of the curriculum and how do we teach them rather than how do we make sure we're starting new companies or how do we make sure we're winning prizes and usually in educational systems we set up rather often we set up um, markers checkpoints that we need to reach that are again very related to the economic systems that keep us in business and that we expect for our students 
But if we think about our values and what it means to be human, we might come out with a different curriculum and one that might be more resilient to the current circumstances. Awesome. Does anyone else have any thoughts about like diversifying what it means to be a circus artist and what that might mean and how, how that might look like? If not, we can move on to something else as well. Okay, Matt, go ahead. Yeah, um, I guess thinking about um, uh, like this uh, this thing we were talking about earlier with travel and how we're changing the um, circus can be uh, performed it's we're not going to be able to get specialist help we're not going to be able to specialize to such a high degree in the future if this is the case that we're not going to be able to travel if this is the case that touring is not viable in the future um, and along with this lack of access to specialist help in order to um, allow you to be a specialist yourself we're going to have to diversify into uh, doing our own uh, doing our own things like it has been um in the past the the case that when you go with a circus tent you help to set the circus tent up you do everything um as as part of a crew it's still the same with a lot of circuses today um but there is also a branch of circus which is kind of newer that uh, that is coming out of a lot of the more elite institutions which is to highly specialize someone so that they don't have the ability to uh, perform their art without specialist help i think that's something that may not be possible in the future it's just something to think about Yeah, that's super interesting. Oh, well, sorry, were you were you about to jump on? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, no, no worries. I think it, it it we actually said it a few times in different ways. It's like we're we always said to kind of go smaller. I feel in the last uh, 10, 20 years, I don't know, we were all about think big and more and more and bigger show, more people on stage and more. And actually, in the last years, even for Easy example of Cirque du Soleil, they tend to reduce the amount of artists that were needed on a show, even it's still a lot of people, like 40 people for, for a show, it is a lot, but still, even for us, smaller company, uh, Machine de Cirque, us, uh, we, we tend to go for less people involved in the show, and so we also become a little more, a little more autonomous uh, and, and, and self-sufficient in, in a way. And I feel like, yeah, we, we talked a lot about go smaller and I kind of heard less for better, even for traveling, let's say, because like we do circus because we want to travel and and it's we, we've done way too much. Uh, so maybe if we can, uh, yeah, reduce that for a better traveling, I don't know, easy example, if we go for, for because it's, it's cool to share our culture with, with different community all over the world. Like uh, for the time, like my first time in Asia, Korea and Japan, I, I was, it was a blast. It was so wonderful to, to live that. So it's like, I don't want to accept, I don't want to say that we can't travel, even if it's kind of a good, a good uh, solution for, for the envir uh, environment. But yeah, maybe less for better. Uh, less big tours, less back and forth countries all the time, and uh, try to be a bit more um, uh, local and, and, and national. And, and when you go abroad and you just kind of structure it even, even better than, than what we were doing so far. So yeah, it's, it's what I heard, less for better and kind of go a more smaller. Yeah, definitely. I think this um this idea of like local touring is really interesting and sort of like having local circus companies um I think is is really cool. Um I kind of wanted to jump back to something Valentina was talking about about um how do you make the not just the the production of the show sustainable, but how do you kind of embed those values 
into the process of creation. Um, I don't, did I already ask if anyone else had thoughts on this? And <laughs> no one raised their hand. Because <laughs> it's a topic I find really interesting and I'd be curious to hear your thoughts about it. Yeah. Well, um, it's more of a question. Like, for me, like, um, how do you, like, sustainability. <laughs> I think it's something big. Like for me, it's still something really, really big. And I feel like, um, let's say William and I are thinking, of, like we have that in the back of our head, like if we do this this way, is it is 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 it good? Is it the best way? Is it bad? But overall, there's so many questions every time and not a lot of answers. So my, it's more of a comment. Like I would love to have a a place that would, and probably there is, and I don't know about, but that would bring different ideas on around it. I don't know, like just having some references, like just just say coffee. Like <laughs> when we drink coffee, some people say like, oh, it pollutes a lot, and it's it's bad for the environment, and this and this, because tropic, tra and other studies say like, no, it's not that bad. It's this is this, like driving your car versus uh, electrical car versus gas car. Like there's so many different ways of doing, and I'm I'm always questioning like. And like what's true in it, what's not. I, I know that mainly just the que questioning is, is the first step and is the process of like just having the thought of it. But at the same time, it would be really nice to, yeah, to just have a, a better, um, better resources to, to access, to know, or, or to at least be able to refer to when you're asking, let's just say like for the company, I bought a big, huge truck that drinks so much gasoline. And at first I was like, oh my God, like I'm, I'm polluting so much and overall, but then I've checked overall and I'm like, oh no, I'm polluting, like it's less using this truck that's been super old that I'm giving it a second life uh, that consumes overall less gasoline when I'm loading it with all that stock than when I'm using a smaller engine that would pull so much heavier weight that overall would burn more gasoline. Like it's all those things that like, but just buying this and making that decision took me months of just like thinking <laughs> of like, so, so it would be really nice. I'm just putting out there that to have, to have like, proper information to have like um yeah to, to have some references that do that that you can rely to and that you can verify and that would be kind of efficient like that would help us being more efficient in a day-to-day -day and more um yeah something to rely on yeah definitely um and it's funny you say that because that's actually something that <laughs> Sony and I have been talking about, like putting together as part of, as a project within Circus Action Network is like finding these resources. Um, but it is like a huge project, and we are two people, so it's been a little bit slow. But it is something that we're working on um, on doing. In the meantime, I do want to offer. Um, have you heard of Julie's Bicycle? Um, they're a or, they're an organization in the UK. I actually. Um, Invited them to join us today, but they were unfortunately not able to. But um, they do uh, work on like sustainability in the arts sector, um, and specifically with like reducing emissions and like efficiency, um, and kind of all across the board. And they have some really great tools, like online tools, um, for calculating your emissions and like figuring out how to reduce. Um, energy use and material use. Um, and so they have some really great resources for that. So I can share that with everybody after this as well. Yeah. Does anybody else have any thoughts on any of that? What was just talked about? Cool, all right. <laughs> um, so one of the other questions that we had that we think is kind of interesting, maybe hard to hard to, to uh, answer is like what uh, what can we say maybe say good riddance to 
in with circus as we kind of look moving forward are there things that are like have been very um inefficient or um harmful in some way or things that like we do because it's the way we do it but that like aren't actually good ways of doing something and are are there things that we can just be like we can just get rid of that go ahead Matt. yeah i think i would also like to bring this back to the sustainability and thinking about when we say like uh, vincent said um, when we say sustainability what do we mean and i think there's a few things within circus that for me are not sustainable and it's talking about more on a personal level than on a material or an environmental level um i i don't know that circus is sustainable for uh people in the long run like circus is at the moment it's about pushing the boundaries it's about pushing the boundaries physically about pushing the boundaries mentally um and technically um and i don't think that's sustainable um and it's something that we should really have a mind uh in uh, going forward in the future and i think yeah it's um it's something that comes up a lot when i'm making my own work now um and i feel that it's not sustainable for me to continue to perform in projects that i'm not fully emotionally invested in because i need to put all of the creative energy that i have into the projects that matter the most to me um so i guess yeah when when talking about sustainability i'm i'm, I'm kind of yeah what what are we talking about when we say i know we're, we're in an environmental uh panel at the moment and we're talking about the the environment but it's also important um the social and psychological impacts of this and it's something that comes up in the paper that you um you sent around as well that it, the impact psychologically and socially of what is happening now um it's a really good mirror to hold up to what will happen because of the climate crisis and i i think it's something that at the moment a lot of artists are finding it really difficult um like both socially and psychologically to exist to find a place for their art um and to be able to survive and i i think it's really important to be thinking about yeah not only the material not only the reduction of impact of uh, the activities that we have but also about uh, how we are as people and the human side of it Alison go ahead an existential answer and a short answer okay the existential answer is i think we need to get rid of some of our definitions of what it means to be a circus professional a circus artist or a circus performer and I think we should each ask ourselves what proof we need of being a circus professional or artist. Because often, if you're able to list your proof ahead of time, you've done that thing. Maybe you needed to tour, or maybe you needed to start your own company, or maybe you needed to have been doing it for 10 years. And then you get to that point, and you're still you doing the thing, and you're not sure if you're really that person or not. So there are these definitions we have, these sort of external proofs that we have. And I think it's important to really question what our own relationship is to the practice and our relationship to economy, to our money, and our relationship to other people, and to take it more internal. That's the existential answer. The short answer of what we should get rid of is glitter. Glitter drives me crazy, and it gets all over you. And I think we could just get rid of it. and. And I'm sorry if that offends anyone, but I'm I'm gonna stick to it. That's my position. Awesome. <laughs> I love that. I love both of those answers. I think both of those answers are really good. Um, but yeah, to to touch back on what Matt was saying, I, I think this is a really good point, and it's something that um maybe we should have made a definition of sustainability at the beginning of this call. And maybe that's something we'll do for next time. But um that's certainly like a way that we try to approach it um, 
Sonia and I through Circus Action Network is that it is this very multifaceted um, thing. Someone said to me recently, and I really like this, that climate change is like the mother of all intersectional issues because it's not just about um, pollution and the environment. It's all, it's about the entire it's the entire structure of like everything basically. Um, and so I guess um, something interesting about that is like you know if we're thinking about creating sustainable circus and we're thinking about also like what Valentino is talking about, the content of the circus. Um, how can we think about what, um, like what some of these other issues of sustainability are that we maybe don't normally think of, like these social issues, these psychological issues, how can we embed that into uh, the creation process and into what we're doing, uh, both like internally within the project and also in terms of how we are uh, working with other people and with the communities in which we're performing. Anybody have thoughts on that? Yeah, go ahead. Well, I would say, I would simply state Alison earlier when she was talking about the curriculum of the school. I think it's just setting up, going back to our values and as individual and as companies and to to just set those values straight like if you know what the basic of what you're doing is and i'm not talking about the it's hard to say in english but there's like there's the the value you think it's a value and there's the real value that's behind it you know like there's the the thing like yeah i don't have any example but like Income is not a value, you know, like the value is, is further inside you. So if you find those strong values, then you just go back to it and go back to it, whatever you try to do, like when you create, when you set up a system, when you interact with people, just try to go back to their values. I've worked recently with Bandaloop, uh, they're a vertical dance company. Um, based on the west coast of the united states and what struck me is how like they they were able within the last 20 something years 30 years maybe to set up to to clarify their values and then whenever you talk to them you are always able to relate everything they do to these things and and it's really interesting and it makes their and i believe it makes their work um it makes them question constantly whatever what they're doing and i think it it makes it more sustainable in itself just because you're you're going back to who you are and you're going back to how can you put this in whatever you do valentina did you want to say something uh yeah um I think it's from what Vincent said about values and what Adesan was also saying before about, um, I think when a lot of people think about circus and uh, sustainability or climate change is about making work that is about that issue. And maybe we just don't need 30 shows about plastic anymore. Like it's, it's, a, good, it's a good thought, but, uh, and also there's some, a lot of people that don't wanna make work that is on that subject and that's fine and maybe it's realizing that as a company or as a circus person a human you have other areas of your life that you can turn to that to this issue to this problem of climate change in order to make your own practice sustainable so i don't know if it's as a company you don't make a work that touches on climate change as per se but you touches on you touch on some values about um I don't know, just being kinder to each other or to to just about kindness or not even about that, maybe about something completely different, but you opt as a company to have a plant-based diet or whatsoever, or maybe none of the above, and you just plant your own vegetables. I feel like there's many multifaceted levels that you can approach this issue and it doesn't specifically have to do like through your work. I think it's about like envisioning yourself as a whole person that have other areas in your life and not banging your head against the wall of like trying to do the best the absolute perfect you know activist ecologist person within your circus discipline will did you want to say something uh sure i can say a lot of things but 
Uh, but no, I would let go uh, Matt first, actually. Hey. Yeah, um, just, I've lost the train of thought now. <laughs> um, I think it was about uh, Valentina when she was talking about do we, should we be making cl uh, shows about climate change and plastic and do we need that anymore? And I think it's something that um, is really important to think about now um, in, the in the current climate and what's going to be happening in the future. It's kind of at the point where we're, it's too late to be informing people and it's more about uh, like how, how can we change our practice? How can we change the way that we do things? And I think then it's more important to be looking at the the actual practice of the craft instead of looking at uh, informing people or like this is just my personal opinion that at this point it's it's not enough to be making work that has a political content. Um, we have to be finding a way to like practice what we're doing we need to change the way that we're living we need to change the way that the art form is produced in order to make it um not just sustainable but uh, able to survive um going forward so not performing sustainability but enacting sustainability yeah exactly like make, making work in a way that is sustainable in all its uh, in all its facets like, how do we cut out all of the plastic use from the shows? Instead of making a show about plastic, why don't we just take away all the plastic? Like, how can we, how can we find a way to practice our art that doesn't use all of the things that we're saying that you shouldn't use, but then we use a ton of plastic in the show? Do you know what I mean? Does anybody else have any final thoughts? I think we're kind of um, reaching the end of our time. If anyone wants to say anything else though, can I use your hand? Allison, go ahead. I know I keep saying this, but I guess I'm saying it to our group, but I'm really saying it to all the people that are listening. We don't know what this is gonna look like in the near term and that's okay. We don't know exactly how we're gonna make money but you can still be a circus artist if you're not doing circus at this moment or in the way you thought you were. And keep, keep doing it for yourself, keep doing what you can and keep looking for opportunities because if you're ready to create and use the opportunities, you will create the future that we will have. We won't know it until we're there. And then, Will, did you just raise your hand? Yeah, uh, yeah. I mean, it's too good with Alison. We we don't know where we're going, but we're going together anyway, right? And I think what we're doing right now today was super interesting and is helpful to whoever is going to watch it. Just the fact that we talked about it, and if we can, because I mean, the next generation is coming, and I say go do circus if this this is your passion and this is what you want to try and and love to do. Go ahead, and I think it's together that that we're going to be able to to adapt the right way because um, uh, yeah we don't know where we're going but uh, if if we just keep keep talking to each other and helping each other and, and schools are there to help but also has older artists with the experience that we have if we just kind of more and more share with the with the with the younger artists coming up uh, and going on, on the market just just together yeah i think uh, we're going to be uh, able to to go somewhere and hopefully it's going to be more positive than uh, how it looks right now. Awesome. Well, that seems like a great note to end on. <laughs> um, so first of all, I just want to say thank you so much to everyone for being here and sharing your thoughts. Um, it's been really awesome to see all your faces and to speak with all of you. Um, I have a few little notes from Circus Talk before we leave. Um, one is that circus talk um oh sorry let me look <laughs> okay so it's um one is they have a program that they're starting up where you can post an event to circus talk today and get paid for uh via circus talk tomorrow so you can um basically have an event uh via circus talk um and uh get paid for that which is very cool um 
So with your basic free membership, you can list your live stream or on-demand shows uh, and sell tickets or collect pay-what-you-can donations. Um, and you can also list classes and workshops and collect the class fees directly through Circus Talk via PayPal. Um, and Circus Talk will also help promote these shows and classes on social media. So to reach the whole circus community and your audience, put your circus classes and shows on Circus Talk for free. Um, and you can uh, get paid in return for that. Um, also, if you'd like to upgrade your membership to Pro, you can sign up for the COVID-19 Pro subscription discount. And the annual Pro membership subscription now is 60% off with the coupon code COVID-19 yearly. And lastly, um, the Circus Talk has a COVID-19 resource page, which updates uh, frequently with a breakdown of resources in each country. So please send your resources and check in to find out what relief and assistance your country has to offer circus artists. Um, so yeah, just once again, thank you guys so much for being here. And um, yeah, I think with that, we can sign off.